technology and networks, we don't currently have access to, to a system that would allow us to stream media live and so forth. But if we did, I suspect, or and this could happen, we would do it because delivering a lecture that way versus sending a packet, which is a, you know, um, Cluen talked about hot and cold media, which I, a lot of folks that study technology wouldn't use those terms today, but, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, one form of media can be more expressive and carry more content, potentially, like video, versus something static like, um, you know, correspondence papers that go back and forth between um, incarcerated students and, and instructors. Who did you say? Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, great, you know, technologist. And I don't think people are still talking about how to go media, but there always, I think, is an opportunity to think about the level of interactivity and, um, you know, coupled with that are those distractions that happen when you're saying, read your um, online textbook, it's free to you, great, you have access to it, it's a democratic form of giving education to students, they don't have to pay for that, but then they might be doing something besides staying focused, listening to one of your lectures in a class or just being in a group activity. Same thing happens in um, an ISP situation. You think about distractions in the process of being incarcerated. And of course, DE. I'm guilty of this where I might be doing something. Like today, I was doing some writing and then I'm you know, uh, going window over, checking CNN or the results yet for the policy. So we all, I think, do that. And there are actually some apps that have just come out recently that allow you to shut down for a certain, a certain period of time certain windows or certain apps on your phone or, or tablet such that you can be more productive. And that's one of the things we've been stressing in our Promise classes is, okay, you have all this stuff available, but it doesn't mean you're going to be good at it. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to manage your time. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to avoid the distractions. Because we all, as academics, as professionals, struggle with some of those same distractions and time management issues. But um, I agree with you. I think super valuable to use forms of technology in our classrooms, but figuring out ways of maybe establishing policies. I know quite a few instructors, if you go to the uh, syllabus website that I set up, um, and I will be doing that syllabus workshop virtually at the end of the quarter, quite a few of the art instructors have, because they have classroom safety issues more than, say, social science or English faculty members do, um, but they have statements that say you must put um, devices away. Because if you are on your phone doing a Facebook update, or even if you maybe are looking at the course syllabus, I'm giving you a safety requirement, safety instruction, could be a chemistry class, and you're distracted, and as a result, you could get injured, and then you know, there's a liability for, for the college. So some disciplines, I think, maybe have a little more weight, biology, chemistry as well, right, where there are clear safety issues that, if aren't followed, could result in, in serious, serious injuries. So, um, but I'm thinking going forward in the future, really um, increasing the conversation we have about what to include in your syllabus, again, it's specific to the discipline that you teach, about these sorts of technology policies. Um, because I think in a classroom setting, I encountered it really heavily last quarter, and I'm, I'm teaching a DE class right now, but I found it so distracting dealing with it. And after a while, I felt like I couldn't say anything because, well, we are asking them to do things online process of our workshops, so it's a really tricky matter when you think about our reliance on it. A lot of uh, the guy who read grad school, Dennis uh, Goulet, this uh, theorist of technology, always said technology was a two-edged sword, you know, benefits and disadvantages, and I think we see that in education. It's like, this, these are really great opportunities for students. I love your point about collaboration, but then what about some of those distractions? What about academic dishonesty that are part of these technology frameworks that we're experiencing now. And I certainly think we're going to have trial and error with this yeah. no matter what. Um, but I think one thing we should consider too is that just because a student is in the classroom facing your direction and not them doesn't mean they're actually paying attention at all. Right. Um, I think it's really easy when we have our phones out to pinpoint the ones that don't seem engaged. Um, but I also think too, we have to think about the students with disabilities, um, such sure. as attention problems and things like that. There's some students that actually interact better when they have their phone in their hand right. and they're looking at it and doing things like that. Well, it seems counterintuitive to what we're doing, but they kind of function that way. Um, versus like if you take away their phone, they sit there and they start like yeah. really becoming a problem for other students as well yeah. because maybe they start wrestling papers, things like that too. Um, but I think another thing too is like how much of this distraction is it it's distracting us rather than the student themselves. I think sometimes yeah. 
as a professor, I get more distracted by the technology or not being used properly than the person that's maybe multitasking in the room. Right. So. Yeah, the disability um, statements, I think, also would be handy here. And maybe conversations with students, if we notice a student who's having an issue. Um, I Years ago, when I taught at, at a university in, in the Midwest, uh, I had a student before class that had, um, I don't know if it was Tourette's, but he had, he had a um, condition, like he needed to release energy, so he would do this thing with the erasers on the chalkboard, sort of just swap them off, and I'd always pick them up and stuff. He, he seemed very, you know, he was like one of my best students, a student, but he had an issue with just energy and, and not being able to control it, so it was, I think, an anxiety. And, and uh, So having conversations with students, if we notice something like that, if it is a legitimate disability, if it's a student who is just, you know, they can't get off their phone or they're constantly doing social media updates, and that's maybe a different conversation. But I think that's really important to add, you know, like a, an asterisk here now. Some of these things, obviously not plagiarism and cheating, but some of those um, distracting behaviors, whatever you call them in a classroom setting, could be connected to um, maybe a legitimate disability. So Kelly Greiner is our new uh, DRC director, so again, questions come up. We can network with her. We can even have her do some workshops on these topics to just educate ourselves a little more about some of those conditions we might see in a classroom and how to manage and mediate those in an effective way that protects that student if they have a legitimate disability and the other students in terms of you know a good learning environment and then your own sanity just in terms of teaching that class. You got really good points there. Um, what I want to add is I like the Coyote app because we can keep people informed about campus events. That's very positive. The one, the, the issues I've seen as an instructor, I would say one, people treat discussion forums like social media and the way they interact with one another and the language that they use. Yes, and it's so. supposed to be a more you know, academic environment. So I've been repeatedly telling people, you know, when people do all the highs with exclamation points, yeah. and I really love what you have to say, and that's not really relevant to them. LOL. Well. Yeah, there's a lot of that, and I'm just like, it doesn't belong in there. I mean, you can do it wherever you want outside of this, but not in there. The other challenge, too, is with on-campus classes, people sometimes, I mean, it's great to have it than, better than to not have it, but when you have a PDF reading of, like, 20 or 30 pages, and a person is just using their phone, and then they're sitting there going through trying to find a passage or something, it doesn't go over very well. I mean, maybe right. it's better than not having it at all, but maybe it's, I mean, maybe it's just barely better than not having it at all because if, you know, if, if they wrote it, they can go to a page, okay, but sometimes people just go in there and then they're, they're going like this the whole time and then they're not really listening, whereas if they had it right there, we go to that page, it's just sitting right there and then you can look up and you're not constantly going yeah. back and forth and because it's not the same and you have to go through a PDF. Well, an annotation, so I've tried this a little bit. Like I have all sorts of ebooks on my tablet and I've tried some of the PDF programs and highlight and annotate, but I sound super traditionalist, but it, it's not the same, right, as going through a printed text and doing annotations, making marks, and so forth. Um, so maybe if it's a, a key exercise, if you're reading Mock or someone in your class or you're reading, you know, a poem and you really want students to work through and annotate it and have it physically in front of them, Maybe you know we could state that as a requirement and say, hey, I really would like you on, on this day to work through this. Or you could state it as a general preference, you know, throughout the quarter because you were trying to impart on them, we all are, um, your techniques for academic success um, and what's worked for you. Now again, everyone approaches it differently, but it's a good conversation to have. I think the uh, the apps people have for their like laptops or tablets or whatever. You'd be able to mark it up. I mean, I personally, I wouldn't prefer that, but that's just because I'm old enough that I like the paper. I just like the paper. I don't want to, I don't want to abandon the paper. <laughs> and that's just my preference. And I understand yeah. if you like the, if you grew up with a tablet, that's fine. Yeah. The problem is when people are using a phone, and like a tablet is obviously larger, or a laptop where you can go through more reasonably. But it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's not, I've never seen where, I've never seen someone who's rifling through their phone that being practical yeah. for our conversation, as opposed to having, People will put a, a, an app on their tablet where they actually mm -hmm. have to Or a laptop, yeah, yeah. Chromebook. Uh, which I think yeah. is a good idea. That's yeah. actually, I think, if you like technology, and I like technology in certain places, yeah. um, but the phone just is not a big enough screen, and every time I've ever seen that done, which is a bunch of times, it's just not really, it's not as nearly as effective, I think, as a tool in that capacity. Yeah. Let's just say real quick on that, I think, you know, there's a teachable moment there, I recall in the last 
quarter of one of my promise classes, we were going through note taking, and it was a very mini version, but we talked about, you know, when you read a text and work with it, here's how it happens physically. I showed them some samples online of just different approaches to note taking. I showed them a copy of my notebook by Moleskina and said, you know, I like a traditional notebook. I said I often will take it into meetings, board meetings where other people are on laptops because it, it's a different focus for me. If I'm writing in a notebook traditionally with a pen, then even if I'm typing and paying attention to the meeting. And then I show them apps for online uh, annotation, you know, different techniques using the device. And we talked about the differences. So maybe it's an opportunity in a class early in the quarter, I know we have a lot to cover, to talk about some of this and say, I'm going to give you my take on this, and I may sound traditional, but there's a reason behind this, and I want you to at least consider it. And then have that conversation about just viewing a phone, a very small screen, how that is maybe not as effective as, as viewing it. I mean, page. honestly, it isn't. I, don't, so, I can't remember a time where anybody who ever did that was able to go right to it and find it and then talk or speak about it. Like, they could draw something. Because I think if you're doing the assignments on your phone like that, I think this issue is going to get complicated. I'm all for paper, like 200 percent, because we know reading retention rates are higher. It I mean, is. Everything on like paper is much, much better, but we're losing this battle. Like, there's no yeah. way. Oh, yeah. um, textbooks, like, there's a lot of them now that are only electronic, and it seems like only like it's going more and more in that direction. Yeah. Um, even, I mean, the promise situation is like doing that to a certain degree, but I think just the big industry is doing that too. Um, and I think we're going to have to figure out ways. And you made a really good point of like educating students on how to do these things effectively on electronic devices. And just hearing this conversation, it's clear to me. I teach students how to annotate on paper and pen, but I don't do that on other devices. Oh, and I need to start learning those skills. Yeah. Um, I think another issue that's going to come up is that what resources do students have? And I agree that tablet, tablets and laptops are much better in person. I would prefer that, but you all students have access to that. Do they financially have the money to have sure. that, or is that the only device that they can have in class is their phone? Um, and then what ends up happening if you say you have to have a tablet and there's only e text or something? Um, I don't know. These are it's just it, to me it seems like we're going to have to grapple with technology quite a bit as we move into this. And I don't know what the solution is because I agree. I think phones are problematic for numerous reasons. Um, also, I think too, they're just so easy to like start getting distracted yeah. and other things. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if maybe there's apps out there where there's things that make annotating better so you can actually be on the same page. Um, but one thing that I noticed that's really difficult for me is if I have a hard copy and then all my students have electronic copies, we're not talking about the same things because the locations are different for them. Right. And so that's one thing that I would hope is that we can start getting something standardized with that. Um, and like, Part of me wonders if I'm the problem. If I was on an electronic device, it would be easier to get all my students on electronic devices because they could say it's at this percentage or whatever mm -hmm. it is there. Um, but right now we have this split. At least I always do. Yeah. Um, no one's willing to be 100% electronic. No one's willing to be paper hard. Unless I give them the handouts or it's a textbook. Sure. You, yeah. you know, it's interesting. When it comes to the electronic devices, the price of some of this technology has dropped considerably. You don't need to buy the high end in order to have something that works. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's like, and if people, it's like this, if people are saving all this money, like I, I've adopted OER in two classes, American Government Politics and U.S. History. You could take me for U.S. History the whole year and not buy a book. If you wanted to buy the book, it only costs you like 40 bucks, the, the print bound mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't ever see at a point, like we've discussed this before in other contexts, I don't ever see there a point where it's ever just going to be like, it, it, there, there isn't any kind of cost to you of some kind. Mm -hmm. And like with the technology becoming so common in so many places, it brings the price down. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting. Because I think community colleges have had a democratizing effect on education in general. Going here is far more affordable than going to UNR or going to Sac State. People are saving a lot of money. I mean, at some point, we probably will have to transition and require that people have it. Now, if that ends up being like grant funded where we provide them to people who are lower income, we can do that. But I, I, I just think that when it comes to school, there's going to have to be some cost, yeah. some buy in from yeah. the student that they're going to have to provide for something, right? Because but, otherwise, I mean, you've got to invest something on your side of this, too. Like, yeah. it, it, I don't ever see a point where you're going to be able to go, it's not going to cost you anything. 
And if, the com and if the culture has changed to the extent to which the technology is so commonly used by people, well then it just becomes an expectation and it's not even a matter of cost anymore. Like phones, like everyone has, like back then, everyone has, everyone has an iPhone these days or like a smartphone. I rarely ever see a flip phone. And with a flip phone is usually somebody who's uh, elderly who's like yeah. hanging on to the flip phone. And so the more common it becomes, I just think, and the more pervasive it is, it's just like, it just becomes part of the cultural expectation. If you come to school, it's going to cost you something. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, I thought everyone had phones, but at UNR, that's not the case a lot. Really? I mean, I'm surprised, yeah. Wow. Because there's a lot of students that A, either break their phones yeah. and then can't repair them, uh, but there have yeah. been a lot of students that have had that okay. for cost reasons and other things don't have access to phones. I was surprised because yeah. I thought this was something that everyone has it's you're in the stone age if you don't have one, yeah. I know that type of thing. Um, and I started trying to use materials more online and doing things, and that's when I started noticing in the classroom who doesn't who does not have technology, um, which kind of outs them in certain ways. And I do think it's going to cost money to go to school, yeah. but I, at a certain point, I think we're going to have to put policies in place that say it's an expectation to go to school, you will have to have this device that can go on there. Um, but how we grapple with that yeah. in the meantime. And maybe that's not an issue here, I don't know. That's just I, I think it is, and I just wanted to say that we do have, part of this is promise, but it's also really before promise equity. We do have uh, Chromebooks that students can check out from the library for the, the whole term. You know, there's a, um, I think a deposit on there or a thing, you know, like if it was lost or something like that, you know, you'd have to pay back the cost. But so we do have access to that. So I feel like that technology gap, I would expect just with more promise, um, this million dollar, or so, I, I think in scholarships coming through the foundation, you know, donations, we can easily funnel a lot of that to um, low cost media or you know, Chromebooks, whatever for our students. So I think that won't be a hurdle for me. It's that, but it, it is a little bit of that issue of I think of the, the work of Dan Ariely in behavioral economics, and he does have this you know statement that the minute you buy something, right, like you sort of imbue, you infuse the object with your own personality. And retailers, you know, know that like they give you very um, lavish or you know um, liberal return policies because they know that the longer you have the object or thing in your home, you attach your own identity to it. And so, when you apply behavioral economics to the student situation, the one thing I worry about, and I've said this actually to my students in class, I say this exact thing. You know, we're giving you everything free, but what are you going to give in return? You know, uh, how are we going to know that you're going to have the motivation? And I worry about that. I mean, it's a fine line because we don't want to just um, punish students, right, because of their socioeconomic situation, housing, food insecurities. We have to be cognizant of that. But then if there isn't an investment, particularly if the student can make that investment, you know, following this theory, that without some kind of financial investment, you might then not be invested just personally in terms of uh, completing your work or um, seeing it as something important because we often do value things that we purchase, particularly for setting up for them, working hard for something, you know, buying your first house or car or whatever. So I worry about that and I've, I've verbalized that to my promise students and, and their answers weren't that I, you know, a lot of crickets there, you know, sort of like not a, r a real good response to that question. I mean, everybody grows up in different families, right? And mm -hmm picks up on different lessons from their, their parents or the people around them, their friends, the peer group even. I think that something's interesting. Like if people want to get something for their own personal use, typically it's like if they'll find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you say to them, well, we need, we're going to need this for the class, then all of a sudden you get this pushback and anger about it. And it's almost like it's very strange to me because, you know, obviously we could have four different opinions in here for what school needs each of us, right, and what we're willing to do in order to make that happen for each of us. And that's fair, that's fine. I, mean, I, 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 I accept that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the electronic devices, even like when I remember when I was in Texas, this was in 2014, I, I intentionally bought a Moto X when they were still available because they were being made in, in Fort, Fort Worth, Texas. Well, they had a deal where if you bought the Moto X, you could get the Logitech, I don't know what the brand was, it's, I can't think of the brand, it's a brand you've probably heard of, but it's not like, it's not like an I, iPad or something, mm -hmm. to get a, a tablet. Right. And so I was like, okay, well then I'll go, because I didn't have one at the time. I said, okay, I'll get one of those. So I did. So people, companies do, and this is five years ago, last December maybe? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, last December. So like companies have these deals, and they didn't, it really didn't cost that much. The, the cost was like negligible. It was like cost of nothing. 
they were offering it. So the technology, the price of it's come down so far and make it more widely available to more people. So if it's a hundred bucks or something, it's a hundred bucks. I mean, yeah. when I bought my first PC in, in the mid nineties, <laughs> that computer cost me two grand. I know. Yeah. I mean, now you can get a tablet for like a hundred or two hundred dollars. Yeah. So that to me is like oh, you can get it's rather fifty bucks too. Yeah. Like, you know, dirt cheap. Yeah. And, and you know, pay as you go phone a Cricket or before I I finally got an iPhone, but for years we had these pay as you go and an Android and they were clunky, but. You know, you could surf the web, you could read ebooks, you could do video camera stuff. So I feel like the technology combined with the promise stuff, combined with just, as you said, community colleges as like a, a cheap form of education, like we're getting, you know, really good in terms of just access. But the, the question is more maybe using that technology, again, the distractions. And David, before you came in, we were just talking about how, you know, we're requiring students to use ebooks and it's hard to patrol in a, in a classroom setting students and their devices simply because it's often a part of, of the instruction. Logan was talking about the fact that um, at UNR there were students who maybe because of accidents their phones would break and then so you'd, you'd worry about they wouldn't have access to the information because they didn't have maybe a mobile device. So it, it's kind of creating a new maybe form of disparity there. If a student didn't have um, a phone I guess we would tell them Let's work with the equity office, and we can at least get you a Chromebook. You know, you're not going to be able to text, maybe, or do some of the social media stuff, but we're going to get you the Chromebook so you have access to your OER materials, and you can look up websites and research things that you, that you need, and so forth. Submitting your papers on Canvas, and that's the big one, of course, is that any device that we have now, with our new LMS learning management system, you can do things. I will grade on my phone sometimes. It's really small, but if I'm stuck, like if one time I was in Europe. On a train, I have free Wi-Fi, and I was using this, you know, no one was around me, but I was dictating and doing some of my grading because I had to get the grading done on the train. But um, it, it wasn't ideal by, by any means using, a, using Canvas on the phone. But Canvas will run on any device imaginable, which is great for our students in terms of being able to access their online classes. So, Damien, you just came in. Do you have any um, insights on, I mean, teaching wilderness, do you... I, I, I take it if you're like in a field setting, do you have a device policy? Do you uh, use cell phones, I think you told me some time back, to make last minute arrangements? Like if you're going climbing somewhere and you have to change, you often will use texting, is that? Yeah, it's for, for communication, it's, yeah, it's texting with students. Yeah. But uh, the Wilderness program as a whole is looking at, I mean we have online classes now, this is the first quarter we've done some online classes. so. We're definitely looking towards expanding maybe more online classes and seeing what the feasibility is. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's where things are going. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. seems odd. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, for some of that initial stuff, we talked about with culinary as well. If you can do safety training and policies and do some of that DE, and then when you get in the field, obviously, that's the, the hands on stuff that they can do there. Yeah. So. The lecture based stuff. And, Maybe using these smart classrooms mm -hmm. as uh, we get a lot of people that come in from the Bay Area since we have weekend classes. Yeah. So facility, a lot of our lectures will be midweek, so it'll be hard for them. You know, almost impossible for them to meet here. Yeah. So just giving them that opportunity. It's a good, good, good practical solution, but. Uh, Thing we were saying earlier is maybe opportunities when we think about setting that class up to include statements um, for your own discipline, your own you know personal policies about technology, about appropriate use and appropriate use. And then as JD was getting at, maybe an opportunity for you to do a mini lecture and say, I'm going to take you through the differences between annotating and interacting with a physical text on your desk with a highlighter. You know, sticky notes, however you do it, and we're going to do the same and, and talk about how that happens because you can do annotation and highlighting on a tablet or a smartphone. But to talk about the differences, and I, I feel at least like you're still promoting the idea that the students could have access to the technology, but you're telling them there's maybe a price to pay, if you will, in terms of the quality of how you interact with the text or the process, the research process. Uh, a lot of us, if we're doing research or writing, we like to have things physically laid out. I love having just papers and I'm constantly going back and forth, charting stuff out, ideas, diagramming things. I don't have a way of doing that 
um, online. In fact, I was working on something today. I printed it out last night um, just to work on it today in the office, you know, because I said, I, I can't look at this on the screen for what I'm doing, because I physically want to interact with it and highlight, and draw things on it, and put sticky notes and so forth. So I really like your idea just of having that conversation with students, to really be open and honest about it. Do you think they would respect that? Do you think they would understand it? Or would they look at you and say, well, you're just the, you know, the old fogey, or the middle-aged fogey who, uh, you know, doesn't like technology? <laughs> Middle-aged folks. Some people still do mark them up. And a lot of people do yeah. print it out. I'm surprised the number of people who still buy a hard copy of the book. Yeah. I'm surprised. You're right where that's where we're going. We're going in the yeah. direction where it's going to be see less and less of it. So. Which to me is a huge disadvantage for students because if you buy an electronic copy, you can't resell it. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they're doing it cost-wise, too, because a lot of times you might use book much cheaper than the electronic ones. So. Right. The OERs I'm using are free. It's just oh, okay. the PDF. If there, there's actual Rice University has open yeah, stacks. stacks. So they just, the whole textbook is written by credentialed professionals, but you just download it. Oh, nice. So okay. you can actually read it on the website, too. And I think um, the cost is like $19 for hard copy. Mine is more. Yeah. Oh, yours is more. Okay. I know the social one is super cheap. If you get a used one, it's going to be that low. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing, and it's not unrelated to this, I worry about when we were doing, you know, I, I think it's great we did the OER, the OEI, the ZTC, the Zero Textbook, all these acronyms. But one of the things I, I share with some of my colleagues, you know, having done quite a bit of publishing myself, including writing a social textbook back in the day, um, I am concerned, you know, sometimes with some of the quality of, of the work. I remember researching it for cultural anthropology, and they currently don't have an open stacks for cultural that you bring for the social. But I found some of the quote texts people were using online, these wikis, really questionable materials. You know, plagiarized and just the sources and the writing style. So, you know, I am an old fogey or middle aged fogey when it comes to research, and I feel like there's a challenge with that. Now, open stacks and certain organizations doing a lot of these textbooks, the qual the quality control is equal to um, I would say to peer review processes that happen for you know major presses or textbook companies, whatever. But I do worry about that sometimes. Is that if we just tell students look at this article, and then you have the issue as an instructor. I'm teaching a class for the second time. It's all open source materials. But going through this time, I discovered that some of the things I wrote for lectures and discussions and exams uh, were now unavailable. And there was one really good race video I was using, and it just disappeared. You know. And so then I have to go back and deal with the fact that the stuff goes out of date very quickly. Unlike traditional text that we would use, yes, a new edition would come out with a few new photos and new case studies. But a challenge of having so much information, we've talked about this in the past, is calling through that information, organizing it, being systemic about it, making it meaningful, and then verifying again the legitimacy of the information, that whole thing about, you know, what happens you're teaching bio and someone's reading some questionable blog posts. But then also just dealing with the fact that the stuff is changing so quickly and links go dead and you have to then do those updates that are time consuming and then maybe affect your pedagogy or the content you're teaching because something you found was really useful for this one concept and then it just goes dead and you don't have access to that anymore and you have to basically revise the text. So some issues there I think in terms of using this free materials online just in terms of a lot of uh, questions about quality. Um, Perspective. I mean, a lot of things to uh, the web here with the spirit materials. A couple minutes to. Uh, so we sort of had, uh, and I'm trying to could cover most of these. Um, I like, you know, Logan's idea about collaboration. I, I should add that to social networks and community because we're working in this Rowing into America um, event right now, and, and we'll plug there students. If you know any students, uh, rehearsals today or tryouts, three to five in, in, in B103. But one of the things that occurred to me is we can use their contact information and you know, contact them via their phones and send them text messages. So it's certainly a way of collaboration outside of the classroom that, that I think is potentially really effective. Some of the stuff that we talked about in terms of the negatives, I feel like we still have to think about that. The biggest one for me, and this maybe will come up at our next workshop, um, talking about DE versus ISP versus face-to-face, it's still that effect of a student who's used to typing something, uh, 
on social media, um, getting involved in a flame war over politics or something, and then they take your class. And I'm always saying it's, it's happening a lot in social science because we're talking about race, we're talking about gender, we're talking about social class. And sometimes students don't have the restraint or even the style to understand they can't just use that same, you know, uh, flame war approach that they often use when they're interacting with others on social media. So that's a specific area where I think it would be good to do some future workshops just on student behavior, and I will be offering some, and we can certainly have some as part of our faculty flex activities. But I feel like that is one that is always uh, stands out to me as a concern in, in DE's classroom settings is because of that expectation from social media and, you know, um, less tolerance, less filters, and so forth. So. One thing I, I, I'd like to bring up is just on Passport. Mm -hmm. In order to contact students, I just have their student email, and it's, they never look at that. No. And no. so I'm, I'm just wondering in the future if we'll have access to the personal email. Because I know yeah. through the instruction office, they have, you know, when they register, they have personal emails. Yeah. That's the, same. Yeah. The, the, the two ideas there, yeah, what you, students rarely check their LTCC email. There is an option. They can link it to their Gmail or Yahoo. So that's a possibility. Can't force them to do that. Or you get into, you know, trying to come up with ways if it's a DE class. Of course, the campus inbox and messaging your entire class can be more effective. I don't personally, I know some of the math teachers collect cell phone numbers and contact. I don't even want to touch that. I don't give a single student my cell phone number. I give colleagues, staff members, I'm not even going to go there, but I, I've been, you, I, you I, have to. I mean, we've been, I, it's, it's a weird issue because I'll get texts all my day, you know, <laughs> odd hours and three days off. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's yeah. definitely something. You know. Something we, we, we need to work on, but I don't know what the solution is. Yeah. Well, isn't there a service where they don't know your number, but everyone signs up for it, and then you can just fire off the message through, and it goes out to everyone oh, in the class? okay, probably. There's a service, but a colleague of mine used to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they don't have your contact information, but you put all of their, or actually they put theirs in, oh, okay. into, this, into this whatever that actually site, sounds and then you send the message through, through that. Okay, like you're texting off the like, It's all personal. That's really She good. would do that to like remind people about quizzes and everything. But you know, I also have to throw this in the mix. Yeah. If you get into doing that like regularly, it's kind of the death by a thousand cuts. I already wrote a, a calendar. The calendar has everything in there, and then now I'm going to send you text messages about yeah. everything. You know, throughout. I mean, that's just I don't know. Yeah, and that again it comes down to personal policies. Again, I, I'm of the view that yeah, the student should be motivated, and he or she should be able to know when things are due, and there should be constant reminders. But I think we all deal with that. Where Student misses the first paper exam, and he and I didn't know. Well, I told you in seven places. Oh, well, you, know, you didn't remind me personally. Okay, well, is that my job, kind of thing? So, there's other conversation to have. Um, well, let's stop on uh, Logan. Oh, I was going to say, depending on how you use Canvas, all those notifications go to the students, too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, a lot of times it's yep. set up already automatically, and then you're yep. not the one doing it. But that's one thing I've noticed here. It seems really hit or miss whether people use Canvas or not. Yeah. Like a lot of my students were saying, I've never used Canvas yet. Like, um, and then others are like saying, all of them did. And um, that's one thing. Like, I think my students at UNR are a little bit better about responding to emails mm -hmm. through Canvas and things like that because it's you know, every single course absolutely yeah. is. Um, but and as an end point or to be continued, uh, yes. Trevor Thomas, our DE uh, coordinator, has been saying that we may move as a college to we allow for web enhancement or campus enhancement for your face-to-face. -face. We may actually then just require it and say you have to at least have your syllabus up there for this very purpose to give our students campus literacy where they begin to understand the LMS better so that they take the first DE class of one of us and they already know the bells and whistles of it. So. It's awesome. I mean, I don't... Everything you just put on there, and then you don't have to be talking. Yeah. You just say, "We'll go and take a look at the It's all there. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Then you can carry over absolutely. year after year. I mean, yeah. you can copy your complete class too. Yeah. So I don't know why people. Well, I know why people don't like. You know, it's hard to be trained sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how the training is here. Yeah. Because I was trained somewhere else. But okay, well, good. Uh, we're going to stop there. Thank you for listening at home. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, place, and virtual location. Differences and parallels between DE face-to-face -face and ISP. Thank you, those of you at home, JD, Daniel, and Logan for participating. And right, we're done. Go get this.